Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to day two of the Stockholm Internet Forum, and it's a pleasure for me to see so many alert faces after the exertions of uh, day one, in which many important matters were discussed, some great questions raised, some controversies engaged, and uh, on the part of one or two, some rather nice uh, food consumed. And I hope we can sustain that excellent tradition in day two. A word of personal introduction. I am Graham Hutchings. I am the managing director of Oxford Analytica, which is a global analysis and advisory firm drawing on the expertise at Oxford and other universities to provide clients with an understanding of the volatile, complex world of international politics and what they mean for governments and business. We are talking today in this first session in some distinguished company, and I mean yourselves who I can see in front of me and those who are in the digital space as well. Uh, we are talking about the issue of freedom from fear when using the internet and the rule of law. What is the rule of law in this context? How does it apply? How might it be shaped? How might it be implemented? How might it be monitored? And it's my pleasure to introduce to you the ladies and gentlemen immediately behind me who are going to get the debate rolling on this particular topic, and I'm going to introduce them very briefly. You can find their details online, so there's no need for me to go into those here. I'm going to int introduce them in the sequence in which they're going to be making some opening remarks. So it's my pleasure to welcome Gillian York, who is Director of International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in the United States. She is seated to my immediate left. Next to her is Olaf Aaron Kroner, Ambassador and Senior Advisor to the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, one of our hosts for this gathering. And then we have Anriette Esterhuisen, who is Executive Director of the Association for Progressive Communications from South Africa. We then have uh, Shahzad Ahmed, Country Director of Bites for All from Pakistan, and Gabenga Sisan, Executive Director of the Paradigm Initiative of Nigeria. So why don't we give them a bit of applause already for getting up on stage and... and um, taking on this first session. What I want to say also by way of introduction is to introduce Martin and Joachim. They are our digital curators. Martin is taking what we develop here into the outside world, and Joachim is bringing the outside world into us. And I do want to use the intellectual capital that I see before me and that I know exists in the ether to make us work and to fashion as content-rich a session full of ideas, possibly controversies, matters to think about as possible. So please do not be bashful in raising questions. Please do not be timid in challenging us, in asking us, and particularly the experts, not so much me, did we really mean what we said then? Or why did we not say something we should have done? I do urge you to uh, be forward in that particular respect and will frequently ask you so to do. So, let me, before I turn to Gillian to open up from their particular perspectives, let me turn to some general remarks about what we're concerned with here. And I think the first thing I want to say is we are concerned with less what has happened, though that shapes the way we think about things very clearly in the matter of the internet, its governance, its security, issues of fear, privacy, surveillance, and so forth. I want us to think about practical solutions, implementing methods, where agreements may be found, where disagreements are likely to be prevailing and very obstructive in this area. Because what we're talking about when it comes to matters of the rule of law and internet governance is something that men and women have given thought to in a different context over millennia. 
wherever men and women of a thinking nature have got together, the issue of governance, of organization, of where the authority of the individual runs and where of that of the government stops, these have been central to our concerns as human beings in different cultures, in different climes over a very long period. When we talk about the internet, we are talking, and governance, we're talking about creating, transferring where possible, some of those conceptions that we've developed for the physical world, if we want to put it like that, into this new vector, into this new spectrum. And if you look at the history of attempts to form international governance, you do realize very quickly how difficult that is. Just think of the United Nations. That is one of the more recent attempts, namely since the end of the Second World War, to arrive at international governance. It's possible to hold a variety of views about the success of that concept of international governance, but I think there's probably only one view that we would want to hold about attempts to produce international governance for the digital age, and that is how difficult it is going to be because of the different stakes and interests and power centers involved. Our customary concepts of governance that we've grown familiar with, indeed, easily transferable to the digital space. Because in the digital space, the frontiers are fluid. The frontiers are elastic and ill-defined. Moreover, our concepts of governance are very much shaped by what in the political science and historical literature is referred to as Westphalian notions of national sovereignty. That national sovereignty is a matter of something that is contiguous and consistent with national frontiers. That clearly is a problematic notion to bring over into the sphere of digital governance where those frontiers are not so apparent. And the final observation I just want to share with you and put it out there for your consideration, and you may want to come back on this during the course of our session, is this. When we talk about developing a rule of law and a system of governance for the Internet, is it bound to be shaped by the existing configuration of power in the non-digital space? Is it not the case, for example, that there is a significant body of world opinion, let's call it, not very helpfully perhaps, as the developing part of the world or the global south, that says that it's time to rearrange the major configurations of political, diplomatic, military and economic power as the proportion of economic wealth developed across the globe becomes more and more concentrated in and stemming from that part of the community. Can we take, then, into the world of internet governance a new kind of paradigm, one that is based on what many people would say would be necessary, one of greater equality and balance rather than just flick a switch and take the existing configuration, the status quo, into this digital space. So these are some of the very broad issues, the rather important uh, main themes that I think we must have in mind when we think about internet governance. And I'm going now to turn to Gillian to, as it were, scale back a little bit and focus on some of the more practical work that she and her colleagues have been engaged in when it comes to the matter of the rule of law and the internet. Thank you. So thank you, um, and thank you for having me here this year. Um, and I just want to say um, a couple of things before I get into these principles that we're, we're talking about here. Um, as my colleague Eva Galperin tweeted yesterday, you can't talk about internet freedom in the developing world without talking about Western surveillance. Um, and so I, it, I would be remiss not to mention those who are not among us, blacklist or no blacklist, I feel as though Jacob Applebaum and the others that were not invited this year were really missing out on that because I think that they have a unique combination of technical and policy acumen that could be incredibly helpful in this particular context in talking about mass surveillance. So, what we're talking about here, by and large, is the, chi the, the shifting context that we're dealing with online. And a large part of that is around metadata, as we've talked about consistently over the past year. 
And so these principles came about from the idea that metadata should have the same protections as content, that data is, we talk about data being protected, but we don't talk about metadata, and that while today we're all generating much more metadata than we were historically, so the context has shifted. Now, there doesn't need to necessarily be some global framework to fix this problem. What it requires is for governments to incorporate this idea and these principles into law. So, the preamble to these 13 principles, and if, if you're unfamiliar with this, the website is necessaryandproportionate.net. These were created in the run-up to last year without understanding or knowing the context that we would be speaking of today, um, and were launched just shortly after the Snowden revelations. The preamble starts by saying that privacy is a fundamental right and is central to the maintenance of democratic societies, to human dignity, and it reinforces other rights such as freedom of expression and information. And so what are we talking about? Well, obviously from the title we're talking about the necessity and proportionality of, um, the, of surveillance itself. So that brings into question whether mass surveillance, whether the tracking of entire societies versus individuals um, under the law enforcement context is necessary. And we would argue that it's not. So we're, we're also talking about transparency, legality, and legitimate aim. And in the US context, I think that, and I, I know that Olaf will be speaking a bit about the rule of law. In the US context, the problem that we're facing is not inherently about the rule of law, but rather about the secrecy under which all of this is taking place, about the international agreements that are happening beneath our noses rather than out in the open, and about the lack of safeguards, both for international cooperation and against illegitimate access. And so what do we expect or want from these principles? The idea is that we want states to implement these into national law, and we've had some successes um, in talking with political parties. Many political parties um, around the world have been discussing this, willing to take it on board. And that these principles are a way of applying the existing rights, the rights that we already have ratified in the international um, covenant on civil and political, oh goodness, rights, sorry. Acronyms, anyone? No. Um, <laughs> So we want to apply the existing rights to our digital environment, and we want judges to apply these laws correctly. And so these principles are simply guidance for how we can create protections in the national context, which I know many of my colleagues up on stage will be speaking about, how we can create, uh, how we can apply the law correctly in these contexts, and how we can help policymakers incorporate these rights into digital and surveillance laws. Um, I know at least in the US, and I'm sure that this is true elsewhere in the world, our lawmakers, our judges, our Supreme Court do not have the technical knowledge to apply these rights consistently. And that's what we've been seeing over the past decade, and that's why we're doing this work. Great. Thank you, Gillian, very much. Let me um, interject here one very brief but important thing. Hashtag SF14 is what you need for this session, um, so please do use that uh, key to the conversation. Uh, let us turn Olaf to you, and um, I know that you've got some remarks that relate very much to Gillian's, but also lead us off into some other considerations. Yes, um, uh, I think uh, it is definitely so that we are in entering in, or have already entered into a new technological paradigm. 98% of the stored data today are actually digital data. And of course, those digital data, they are accessible in a way that analog data was not, uh, or were not. And, and um, uh, we want the access to data, that is the whole thing that we are so fond of the internet, but we also want protection uh, from th these, uh, the data being, uh, being misused. And here, uh, I think that the concept of rule of law is so extremely important. When we started to activate uh, Sweden more on the dip cyber diplomacy arena in, in um, what, five, six years ago, uh, we started to push for a resolution in the Human Rights Council stating that human rights offline should also be applicable online. And we were successful in, in 2012. We got the unanimous resolution in Geneva stating this principle. The next thing is, of course, how do you implement this, this nice principle? Because 
it's not enough to say that they are applicable. You also need to show how you make them applicable online. And here we come into the very, very important con context of rule of law. And we thought a lot about it. And um, in July last year, we were very happy to see that <laughs> Uh, some of the NGOs and the civil society came up with certain principles, actually doing exactly this, pr uh, proposing a mechanism to implement human rights and existing rights online as they were applicable offline. And um, uh, we looked into this and, and said, well, let's see if we can extract some sort of a minimum standard here. And uh, those uh, and we had a dialogue, we had meetings in Geneva and we had meetings in New York with the civil society and discussing this. And we extracted seven principles that Mr. Bilt then presented in Seoul in, in 2013. And those are so a sort of minimum standard. They are a rule of law standard. And there is a big difference between rule of law and rule by law. And if I try to make this distinction clear, I would say it's a distinction about the consequences. Rule of law is a system of checks and balances, is based on transparency and with the explicit goal to protect the individual from abuses by the state. While rule by law is a system to legitimize, legitimize the abuse of state power to the individual. And if you want to see the difference, you can see the difference in old totalitarian states, in authoritarian regimes where the legislation is not used to protect the individual, it's used to protect the state from the individual. And we have seen a, 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 a number of setbacks in the world the last years. One of the main uh, setbacks is, of course, what has happened in Russia the last years, where we have seen an even harsher legislation against bloggers, where we have seen a totally 100% obstruction within the OSCE concept to, to safeguard the, uh, the security of journalism and journalists. And we have seen a, a number of, of other activities that are actually a combination of very harsh state propaganda, xenophobic propaganda and homophobic propaganda, and the repression of freedom of expression in the society. Now, you singled out Russia there for, I, I, for, I, I for very good reasons, but I just want to ask you a, a, a factual question. Is Russia, in the um, personification of its civil society groups or any other aspect of it, a signatory to these minimum standards that you have been thinking about and that, I mean, there's another question yeah. too coming, which is that you've got seven and Gillian's got 13. Mm. Why have you got half as many as, as she? But come to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, what, in, to what extent is, is Russia part of this conversation about minimum standards? Well, they are they definitely not apply to them. I mean, that's quite clear. If you have look they at signed the, up to them on the one hand? No, they, they haven't signed up to them. I mean, uh, they, uh, if you look at the Russian policies today, and if you look at the legislation that is adopted in, in, in the Duma, it, it's a legislation that is there in order to, to, to hinder freedom of expression yeah. and to hinder civil society organization. They, 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 uh, they, they uh, uh, label civil society organizations as foreign agents, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they are not alone. I mean, we have, we have this, uh, about the same problem in countries like China, we have the same problems in, uh, in countries like Cuba. But yeah. I, I, what I, I think is important is to understand that it is not only a quest question of, uh, of, of legislation, it's also a question of the whole concept, judicial review, uh, uh, public oversight, Transparency, proportionality, etc. Understood, understood. Okay. We'll come back to the 13 versus 7 in a moment, but please, please continue, Olof, with your current theme, and we'll double back. Yeah. To that. Um, what I would say also, when you say, uh, which I think is a very, very valid uh, aspect here, about sovereignty and, yeah. and, and, and the, the lack of borders in cyberspace, I think that it's, we should remember then, however, that the one who who actually came up with the idea about the Westphalian borders, Hugo Grotius, he had also another concept. He yes. said there are natural rights that are borderless. Yes. 
And that is reflected in the international law. So even if you are a sovereign country, you have a responsibility to protect human rights within your territory. Indeed. And those human rights are actually borderless. They are equal for everyone and should be protected, uh, uh, should be protected by every so sovereign state. And that is an obligation you have according to international law. So you go grocer's head, sovereignty, but also the natural rights to protect the individual from abuses. Very good point and, and, and great to have um, uh, a... Um a philosopher and legal theorist whose name is not often mentioned, brought up early in this session. Let us uh, m move on. Henriette, what have you got for us on this theme? Um, maybe uh, a step backwards. I, I, um, I think freedom from fear is, is, a, is experienced by people in a, at a holistic level. It's not just freedom from fear of what you do online. It's, it's, it's um, freedom from fear of being yourself, expressing your identity, being a woman in some context, or being same-sex sexual orientation in some context, being a political activist, or even being a, a willing bureaucrat in an unwilling bureaucracy. So I think, I think the power of, of rule of law, and I think why it is so important that we talk about it when we talk about internet rights, is that it is a holistic context, and it takes the attention um, away from just rights on the internet to, to rights in society um, and freedom and openness at a societal level. And, um, but it's absolutely vital, and I think it, it endures. I think you know, we are a bit of a bubble, internet activists. Um, we're not all going to be here in 10 years' time. Governments come, ag come and go, and they, they're extremely fickle because they... We will be here in 10 years' time. Um, I can assure you of that, but carry on. Yeah. Um, I take a point about transience. Well, if you join yeah. transience. And, um, and I think also the fickleness of political trends and, yeah. and governments respond to a particular political environment. Um, sometimes human rights uh, um, receives, receives a lot of attention. Sometimes they are geopolitical. Sometimes it's, it's Russia. Sometimes it's China. Sometimes, you know, th they're all these dynamics. And I think they don't, they might create opportunities for us to further the, the, the protection of rights, but they don't endure. They're not sustainable. I think the rule of law is and, and we should constantly strive towards strengthening rule of law. And I think it's a very different discussion. You know, um, Gillian, for example, you raised the, the, the issues in the United States and the challenges of metadata um, and how rule of law needs to build the capacity to apply existing rights in the online world. But in many parts of the world, we don't have any rights protection. Rule of law is very fragile. So, so it, our work has to, has to start there. And I think that takes us straight back into the realm of development, you know, and this event is jointly convened by CEDA because that takes us to institutional capacity building. Um, the the law-making institutions need to have the capacity and the accountability to make laws that are laws that are good for people, as opposed to laws that are good for simply governments. So your, your point, in a way, is that I mean, we've got a body of international law about human rights and other issues that were developed pre-digital age. Now we need to transfer some of those into the digital space, but we use this as an opportunity to create a new rule of law environment that feeds back into <coughs> the non-digital world. Is it a sort of replenishment of that sort of content? And Not quite. Setup? I think what I'm saying is that if you have rule of law as opposed to rule by yep. law, um, then it's easy to internet enable it. Yep. And to ensure that it, it protects rights online as well as rights offline. But if you have no rule of law, where do you start? And, and I'm saying what you need to start with is with the institutional capacity to, to make people-centered laws, mm -hmm. to apply them. Um, to have them monitored and held accountable by civil society and by, by the media. So you need capacity building at the media level, at the civil society level, at the research level. So I think it takes us straight back into development and how do you build more stable, accountable societies that have the institutions that can uphold rights and uphold civil society. And I think that's the challenge for us in a, in a room like this where you have people that have rights that are being threatened because they're not applied consistently in the internet and people who do not have rights. Um, 
And, and actually, that's often a real dilemma, because in, in, a, in an environment where internet legislation does not exist yet, how do you approach that? And I think, unfortunately, what is happening in many parts of the world, um, and it's very helpful that Olaf um, cap captures this as rule by law as opposed to rule of law, because I think the trend that we see in countries like Pakistan, possibly like Nigeria, we'll hear from, from Shazat and Benga, is to make internet legislation from the rule by law uh, um, approach or perspective rather than the rule of law. Okay. okay, that's very good. We will now, in a, in a moment, turn to Shahzad to have a, uh, a bit of time to think about the distinct Pakistan context, which is interesting in a whole number of ways before we move to Benga and Nigeria. But one, one thing I wanted to put out there for broader consideration on the part of our first three speakers, but on the part of you as well, is this notion of international law and its utility. To what extent can we speak seriously about an international system of law that is going to be applicable with incentives to comply and penalties for infringement? Because this is a big problem in international law, which is flouted uh, by the moment, um, uh, almost every moment by governments in certain respects, but there's large bodies of it which also make the world work in the relationship between states in a number of practical uh, areas. But what we're talking about in the digital space is something that is particularly sensitive as well as particularly complex. So do raise any questions um, and make helpful contributions to this conversation, if you would, about international law, broadly speaking, its applicability to what we're considering here. But uh, Shazad, welcome, and um, do uh, unfold the story of uh, the Pakistan dimension and your work there. Thank you. I will, uh, I think I should not only talk about Pakistan, but uh, immediate region as Please. well, where we actively work. Uh, and first thing first, but uh, Andriot was saying in 10 years, one of my uh, uh, guru, he says that an activist should work so tirelessly that he should uh, be working for his own, his or her own extinction. So probably in 10 years' time, <laughs> we wouldn't be needed and then everything is sorted out on the internet side. And uh, yeah, okay. Need to be optimistic. <laughs> uh, having said that, uh, I think in last two, three years, uh, there are a few things which uh, really happened and those were great with the internet. And uh, uh, I think uh, very vigilant uh, media. Yep not only at the global level, uh, but at the national level as well. And uh, in all different countries. I mean, I'm not sure how it happened, but media definitely uh, started realizing, uh, even though in, if I look at from Pakistani perspective, not many uh, media people still understand the political dynamics of the internet governance that is all going around. Because they didn't, I mean, I wouldn't blame, blame them because they don't get the opportunities uh, to really come to such forums and, and really understand what the dynamics are. But still, they have done a splendid job. So, I mean, I would really would want to commend them and their efforts. And this is both conventional and digital media yes. with a very yeah. sharp focus on this oh, topic. Oh, yes. A lot of, they give a lot of space to all these issues now. Yeah. Uh, even with their, you know, whatever limited understanding at times, you know, not necessarily. But they reach out, uh, and then they reach out to experts, and they reach out to people and experts uh, beyond their own country. So this is really fantastic, which I believe uh, that happened in uh, in many countries, and particularly in Pakistan. And another thing, uh, which was really great, happened was Frank Larue, I think. Uh, I, I, would, I would mention him because, I mean, in, in his tenure, uh, in two, three years, uh, he actually uh, helped unite uh, the civil society movement that was working on different aspects of internet. With, and not only he united them, he gave intellectual leadership, yeah. he gave, uh, uh, through his reports, I mean, issues went right up to UN level, and General Assembly and resolutions, and you know, I mean, so 
that was really a uh, uh, fabulous thing that happened and uh, i would i would give him a lot of credit uh, that uh, uh, i mean a lot what he has done was very useful uh, for many of us yes. uh, now uh, a bit uh, uh, the situation is not that good and uh, and, and it there are a lot of uh, dark areas and uh, issues and problems as well on one side um, uh, Frank LaRue in his reports uh, did uh, keeps mentioning that how online and offline is the same and, and how rule of law can be ensured using the offline laws as well and, and how he uh, uh, focuses on more implementation than, you know, I mean, creating more and more and more laws which are not implemented. The problem is now that we are seeing uh, in, in many countries, at least in our region, Censorship is becoming a new governance model. And then, and this is, is this so uh, 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 clearly out there now. And then impunity is deep-rooted in, in, in our cultures, in our, uh, in our governance uh, in, in different countries. Uh, imagine in a country where blasphemy laws govern the internet. I mean, how can you, uh, how can you ensure that uh, freedom uh, from fear on the internet is possible, you know? Let's just say laws. Then, uh, for example, the IT law in Bangladesh, uh, even Bangla uh, India being a, uh, a great democracy, is, is, is a, there are also very problematic laws. Look what is happening right now in Thailand. Uh, what happened in Malaysia uh, around elections, and it, it, it has been happening. What is happening in Indonesia? So, I mean, if I look at Pakistan and Indonesia, and then look at freedom of expression discussion and, and all that what is happening, you know, our laws are actually, um, uh, uh, you know, further uh, aggravating the situation towards... Where is this impulse to censor coming from? Because some of these jurisdictions, as you say, are democracies in which they the, are people, democracies. In which is the people have indeed in, the, in which the people have a powerful say. So the impulse to control, uh, wh where's that coming from, and, and what's it? What's Fear. the driving force? Fear. Yes, <laughs> essentially, essentially that. Uh, I mean, uh, then. Uh, also, introducing more and more laws with no implementation, yep. resulting more and more controls. And what are we doing with, uh, uh, with, with impunity, the culture of impunity? That is a big question. It's not only for the media. It's not only for the, uh, uh, for the, for the online uh, uh, bloggers or people who are, uh, who are out there. It's for everyone, you know. Mm. And I, I, I would command... Uh, command Certain governments who have who have done who have taken measures, and they are trying to be accountable, and uh, they are uh, uh, trying to work with civil society on doing things differently, and, and they want to improve the situation, or at least I mean at least that they are saying at 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 your face that they want to change and do things differently, which is great. For example, I would mention over here, uh, Freedom Online Coalition. Yep. It's a club of good guys. But it's, you are only nine, 19, 20, 22 uh, countries. How you would engage with the you consider bad guys, you know? I mean, it, the, the, the world is beyond those... Uh, 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 Olaf. Yes, we are only 22, I think. Or so, okay. <laughs> but do you know the reason? No, no Western countries are uh, allowed to enter the coalition if they don't join, take a country from the south as well. So it, they are, it should not Excellent. be a club of Western countries. It Excellent. should be a club for but, but I'm, but I'm, but Is that a self-regulation? That's still yeah, a club, a self actually. Yeah. That's just a different kind of club. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I want you to mention all these different yeah. dynamics over here. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it was, it was raised. At the, uh, but the importance of this whole discussion is that um, despite the fact uh, Sweden's principles, 13 principles, uh, so many other uh, uh, UN resolutions as well, 
countries who are who have to put controls who are repressive who are authoritarian and then de democratically authoritarian <laughs> regimes i would say they are going ahead with their own plans with their own like i mean uh, they are employing surveillance technologies. They are uh, uh, bringing in uh, filtering technologies. Uh, they are going ahead with those, and they are not accountable to any uh, global instrument. Or uh, I don't think they are account. And then, particularly, the the, the discussion surrounds uh, blasphemy uh, or, or our national interest or uh, uh, war on terror. Uh, I mean, uh, that yeah. is something uh, we are uh, dealing with, and, and, and how brutally you can't imagine. Yep. Uh, you know, and then th again, I would mention impunity. Yep. So if no, something happens, no point. one is accountable, okay. and then uh, con situation continue to aggravate and then continue to be more problematic. You, you've presented a very uh, balanced and forensic uh, examination of the of the problem. I, I want n now to ask you to address the issues of the applicability of the kind of discussions we've heard at this end of the sofa. How do we get to Beyond, and it's not, it, you know, the, the, this is a very important part of it. I realize that the, the commitment of activists is going to be very much in the vanguard here. But what other instruments, pressures, actions can be taken to unclutter this space and to drive back these impulses to control and to uh, survey and to legislate and to increase the risk? of people speaking out online? Uh, I mean, if, if I look at it from Pakistani perspective, I think we need to uh, work towards ending impunity and implementing laws that we have. And we have uh, some of the brilliant, very good. Uh, what is the interest of the Pakistan government in creating a situation where impunity is diminished? Control. Say a little bit more about that. What, what do you mean by that? You know, uh, so uh, what, what, what happens is that uh, I think online medium or our internet is the most independent uh, medium right now that we yeah. can look towards. Yeah. You know, uh, media can be manipulated. Media can be bought. Media can be, you know, I'm talking about yep. newspapers or the... Yep. Uh, 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 TV channels, and that that is happening right now. If you are following the story of Geo TV uh, in, in Pakistan, or if you are following the media war that now exists in Pakistan between different media channels, is this is mind boggling, and, and you just can't really put your heads on what what is what is all this happening? So so that is uh, that media is manageable, yeah. you know, uh, and it easily manageable. However, um, when it comes to online. Uh, you know, uh, who would regulate me? Who would regulate Banga or Andriyat? If we have want to say something, we would. And now we know how technology works and we can say safely as well, mm. you know. But that is what is the problem, you know. And then I would also mention the role of uh, private companies, corporations, you know. In, in Pakistani context, uh, Facebook, government of Pakistan, a secret agreement, what we will tell you, you will block. Yes, sir. Their interest, I mean, we just want to keep Facebook accessible and open uh, in, in, in Pakistan. Okay, that is, the, I mean, that is, that is I'm, I'm talking about this from the discussions that I have had with the top brass of, okay. of Facebook. So, I mean, their only interest is that, okay, uh, if, if, if they call us uh, and then tell us, uh, so our main interest is, uh, to keep Facebook open and accessible, but what are the principles? What are where are your principles now? The recent development uh, that okay, uh, uh, Twitter agreeing to the government on blocking uh, certain uh, yep. uh, you know accounts or whatever government tells them. So I mean, our experience from the past since 2007. Uh, when we started looking at this uh, uh, with the uh, Citizen Lab, with, with the Open Net Initiative, looking at specifically how internet censorship works in Pakistan, we knew that the that the reason and the excuse is always uh, blasphemous content. Okay. You know, and okay. but it ranges. Uh, I mean, much beyond that, uh, and and then we have ample evidence of that. Okay. So these are the things which are. 
uh, it is it is happening in other countries as well. It's not only Pakistan. Understood. It's same in Bangladesh. Understood. It's same in I've mentioned different countries. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Benga of the Paradigm Initiative, welcome. We're looking forward to what you're going to say. Just before we turn to you, I'm just going to ask Joachim, what have we got in the way of questions, issues raised, matters um, that have surfaced from the wider community? Well, uh, first off, there is a lot of shares to the panel for excellent uh, openings. Um, we get a Don't lot of Don't share that with them. They'll become too um, comfortable. Um, <laughs> but thank you anyway. Yep. <laughs> I don't think that's a big <laughs> risk to take. Uh, also, uh, specifically, they're pointing to 13 principles that we yep. got from uh, Gillian. Uh, and in terms of questions, uh, well, uh, how can the judges and guardians of law, how can we get them to understand the internet and raise their digital acumen? So how can we actually educate those who are in, in charge of, of uh, the laws? And, uh, a very specific question is, what about the secret laws? How are they compatible with the rule of law? How about laws where the implementation and enforcement is secret and hidden, like FISA and other laws on surveillance and, so surveillance and censorship? Um, Great. So basically, how is that compatible with the rule of law? We'll come to those in, in, in a moment, just as we'll come to your, your questions as well. Uh, but, Benga, uh, over to you. Okay. So, as, as a Nigerian, when I read that phrase, rule of law, yep. um, you would forgive me for laughing mm -hmm. because um, as any Nigerian in the room, okay, I see one here, would know, that was a campaign slogan for one of our ex-presidents and he promised the rule of law mm. and he said it so much that everyone laughed because it became a joke because you were sure that he was just saying that to say we will get a rule of law. What indeed he was promising was the rules of law because that was what you know, literally existed. And so when I, when I look at this topic, the first thing that comes to mind, you, know, you asked a question earlier about you know, what causes this reaction from governments that want to control and all that. And it's clearly, it's fair. Nigeria at the moment, so we've got issues in many regions of Nigeria, but one of the more popular ones right now is in the north, where there are terrorists who unfortunately recently kidnapped about 300 girls, and we're still asking to bring back our girls. But that has now become, like many other countries across the continent, even across the world, that becomes an excuse for governments to say that, you know what, if you want us to pro promise you security, then we will take your privacy. And it, it gets so bad at times that when the climate of fear becomes extremely tense, when you speak up for rights, then the question you get from people is something like, if you have nothing to hide, then why in the first place are you scared? Yeah. And that's, that's really unfortunate because the reality is it's a climate of fear that governments will jump on to do what they plan to do anyway. And the other problem you know, within a Nigerian context is just you know, ignorance that you can literally <coughs> cut through. So there are legislators who are supposed to work on laws because you know it's it's one thing to say that this law the rule of law exists offline and you want to apply it online but in a scenario where it doesn't it hardly exists offline then it becomes a different conversation so we've had conversations with legislators who apparently have no idea what you know they're talking about when it comes to even making laws one of them for example and it should be sued for plagiarism by the way uh, one of them took an existing law from the previous parliament and introduced as his own bill, only to find out that he had a clause that basically said that if you said anything online that was considered a security risk, you were entitled to seven years in jail and, and all that. And unfortunately for him, he had no idea that was part of the bill. So we've got a very thick ignorance problem where the people who should make the laws I have no idea. We wrote a policy brief on internet freedom and we had conversation with legislators and it's interesting. Some of the things that some of them said, you know, would make you put your hand on your head and say, okay, you know what, I give up completely. So we've got that problem of ignorance, but apart from that, we've also got the fact that there, there are no checks in place. So we've got strong individuals, but not strong institutions. No. Mm -hmm. You have an example where in a state, a governor's wife was allegedly questioned in the UK for you know, carrying extra cash and all that. If you know Nigerian government officials, that wouldn't surprise you. But then she got back home and the state assembly was discussing a bill 
to basically say you can't say things that are wrong against someone in office. And that's not just the state. There is a, another state in Nigeria, Bayelsa State, where we have something that has now been described as a rumor-mongering law, I mean, rumor-mongering bill. Now, how in the world do you decide that something is rumor, right? But it all goes back to the fact that these are powerful individuals who will do anything to protect their own interests. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really unfortunate when you have a situation where you've got a climate of fear, you've got ignorance, and you've got powerful individuals. I mean, it's, it's really unfortunate. Can but you educate them out of this? You're obviously trying to educate the legislator, which is the question that we had. How, how long are they going to have to go to university, these legislators, to realize you know, that they're not doing things the way they should? You know, so it's, it's, this is where the problem is. The conversation didn't even exist. So you had no access. So there were people who were legislators who represented you and you had no access to. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, the conversation is changing a bit because you're not beginning to have people who want to be on social media because they know that's where the young people are. They know that's where you can be popular. Unfortunately, you can also be unpopular there, of course. But they come on there and conversations start. And this is one of the reasons why clamping down on the internet is a serious, serious issue in Nigeria because this social media space, online space, is where people have found their voices. This is where they can express themselves. This is where they can say the things they want to say the way they want to say it. Shazad shall mentioned earlier about media ownership. Media ownership evidently speaks to biases. So even if you say something, you could be quoted another way in a newspaper. But on your own Twitter handle, on your own Facebook page, on your own social media account, you can say what you want to say the way you want to say. So we have on one end this climate of fear and ignorance and powerful people. But on the other hand, we have a growing you know, crowd of citizens who are beginning to speak out because they believe that this is what they want to say. Unfortunately, what this has also attracted on the other hand is that government officials have suddenly realized how powerful social media is. Because, I mean, let's look at it. 2009, when we were talking about social media in Nigeria and talking about people saying online, we're angry, where's the rage and all that. No government official cared. Right. But then, fast forward into, you know, three years into 2012, this led to what, of course, was started at the time Occupy Nigeria. People who were online, who were angry online, moved online and used the same platforms as a tool to basically organize. And what, what you would also see happening right now, as I speak right now in Nigeria, is the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, which government thought was a joke. So these girls were kidnapped in their school, and citizens knew that government would never say anything about it because usually they don't say anything. It's called, you know, convenient silence, you know, robust silence. You keep yes. quiet yeah. and assume it will go away. And citizens began to speak and it morphed into protests. And when this protest started, people were invited by the Secret Service, some were invited, of course, invited in quotes by the police and all that. And this is the reaction people are beginning to see because this online platform was, disreg was not regarded as a powerful platform. But now they're beginning to see this is a powerful platform and we need to do something about it. And this is where I say that fear is what, you know, governments themselves are afraid. And this is, this is where your fear as a government official, your fear as government is projected on citizens. You're afraid that they're going to talk about my wife, about how she, you know, carried too much money. They're going to talk about the houses I have secretly. And she's not mentioned impunity. And this is, this is really important because yeah. when all these things happen, nobody gets punished for them. No. So okay. when Nigeria, for example, began to invest in internet surveillance equipment and uh, the popular deal with the Israeli company Elbit Systems for $40 million, government was quiet about it. But thankfully, and this is one thing we have to be grateful to the Nigerian government for, is that they always make mistakes that reveal the secrets. Uh, so it was, it was great to see a public official, the Minister of Information, acknowledging um, in his response and defense of the contract, yep. he basically admitted, yes, there is a contract. Okay. Of course, his excuse was the fact that the United States does it, the UK does it, so yes, we can also do the same thing. So this is, this is where the problem is. The fact that the Nigerian government, and of course many governments across the continent, they're beginning to realize that these dudes, these chicks, these guys online, are not just going to complain around their social media spaces, they're taking these complaints, they're taking them to the streets exactly. and they are demanding more exactly. citizens. Let me bring Charles adding because he wanted to raise a point. Then we'll come to some questions. There are, there are, there are two important things mm -hmm. which I also want to bring on the table. Who ensures rule of law in the country? So if something happens, 
who you turn to you turn to judiciary yeah you know so some of us uh, have this uh, uh, you know what i should say uh, the, the privilege uh, some in in some countries you even can't reach out to the courts or to the, to the judiciary there are that kind of problems as well that level of problem as well yeah. but uh, in in uh, democratic uh, countries you have access to the judiciary i remember saying this last year as well and i would say it loud out again it's extremely important to 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 build the capacities of the judiciary yep. in, in different countries that is not happening we are uh, we are in the court and, and we already have uh, four different petitions uh, in in pakistani courts uh, and in our petition on internet freedoms in in pakistan have already had uh, 20 hearings uh, uh, till 13th uh, 13th may uh, uh, fabulous uh, you know uh, uh, proceedings and all. It, it takes a lot of time it took like one and a half year to reach up to that level and uh, now this, the 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 issue is referred to uh, uh, supreme court in pakistan because they had ordered uh, on on uh, in september 2012 uh, an order which is ambiguous which is not really uh, very clear and which mentions youtube as you dash tube you know it's that level of understanding at at that uh, apex court you know so how you how you would how you would deal with this uh, this is extremely important to uh, you know bring uh, that uh, i don't know how to do it uh, because there are different uh, you know different protocols uh, to do this but that is important okay. in, in a way and we are you going to I think it is actually very doable in the same way that we have a gathering here of 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 activists people in business government uh working. Can we do this in Islamabad then? We can do this with the judiciary. I think you need Why at not? an institutional level an Wrong independent backup. judiciary obviously but but a more capacitated uh judiciary will begin to behave in in a in a more independent way over time okay. so bringing the legal community together um supporting programs and universities yep. for 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 young lawyers yes. having exchange programs between yes. countries that that bring um legal um, scholars together and okay. students Julian, fellowship you, so there's actually a lot that can be your, done is your point related to this or something separate uh, No, I think Olaf's. Uh, Olaf, uh, you wanted to raise something, and I have a it's, question. It's it's related to this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think th- what what Anjet says about institutional capacity building is very very important. Yeah. That is what we can do. But you can also do it on based on principles that are very old. James Madison said in 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 the late 18th century, he wrote and said, "We shall not write laws on human minds." This is ex- this goes for the analog world and this goes for the digital world and that's the basis of censorship that you believe that you can legislate on people's thoughts mm-hmm. and that's a, that's a fundamental mm-hmm. problem and, here. And, and, and uh, then we have one I, more I, thing. Quick question for you. The change for in the Nigerian context has to come mainly from the Nigerian people. But Absolutely. do you think there is a role for the international community and particularly governments to play in the sense that they condition their trade commercial relationships with Nigeria on certain criteria having to do with human rights extending from the streets mm. to the digital platform would you would you say that would be a positive development to some extent it already yeah. exists of course yeah, it does. notionally but it does. since Nigeria is such an important country we hear a lot about the perils and the problems of Nigeria but there's a lot of interest in Nigeria as an enormously big economically powerful important country with whom governments want to do business broadly yeah. speaking so could they would you welcome it if they said hmm we don't like the way things are going there the nigerian civil society tells us that things aren't what they should be a condition of our relationship with you abuja is that certain things have to happen see there's 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 a there's a a context problem uh with with external intervention and i do not say this to say that the state is sovereign so don't say anything about it but right. there's a difficulty in understanding the context if you don't seek if you seek to bring a template you know to the table and we've seen templates across the world that don't hand too well but the reality is also the fact that every country will pursue their own interests so i'm not going to intervene in your country 
because I love the citizens. I'm going to intervene to be sure that my own citizens and my own country get better. So that's where it gets a bit complex. And that's where, you know, I clearly say, you know what, in this area, I wouldn't speak as an expert. But where I would speak as an expert is where citizens are involved. Yep. So we're speaking of the judiciary, the judiciary in Nigeria. I mean, we went to court and said to government, this is the fact on the table, right? You signed the Freedom of Information Bill into law. And we're using this same instrument to ask you a very simple question. What on earth are you doing with this $40 million worth of equipment for internet surveillance? And the government did not respond. And the case, well, we went to court because they didn't respond after seven days as, you know, as they should. And we got to court and a biased judge clearly said that we have no business that we're basically uh, prognosing you know, in, 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 in issues that don't concern us. So you also have that problem of impunity within the judiciary itself. Okay. And in that kind of case, the people that I really look forward to, to speaking up, are citizens. Unfortunately, the problem initially, you know, before now, was that these same citizens were being terrorized by the context of, or basically the climate of fear, where you live in the northeast of Nigeria, right, where you see people killed by terrorists. And when you are asked for cooperation by the state to, bri to bri provide information, you're asking yourself very simple questions. If I provide this information, I'm at risk. If I don't provide this information, I'm at risk. You know, and so that's the, there's a context of citizens who are really afraid and can't speak up. Okay. But thankfully, the conversation is changing right now. People are beginning to realize that, you know what, at the end of the day, this country is ours. This is all we've got, and we've got to speak up. So yeah. yes, uh, we yeah. would love one day to begin to see a more active, maybe even activist leaning judiciary. But for now, I think the solution is in the citizens educating themselves a bit more about issues that the reason why I speak for my own privacy and demand for that is not because I'm afraid of anything, but because it is simply my right as okay. guaranteed by yes. the Constitution. Very good, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, questions from these within these four walls. I see a lady's hand there. We'll take a couple. We'd like contributions to this conversation, participation. We'd like criticisms, points that have been omitted, points that you think have been unduly emphasized. Uh, the lady there, do we have more than one mic um, at a time or just? And I, I think I saw the gentleman uh, down here. So, ma'am. The electricity uh, has to travel down the wire and get to you. It, it takes a few yeah. moments. Uh, my name is Anas Salim and I'm from Pakistan. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to mention was uh, that uh, a comment was that it would be great to have, uh, there's a strong panel here, it would have been great to have legislators and, or a lawyer on the panel talking about how we can use the rule of law or how we can use existing law to strengthen um, freedom of expression or freedom of speech. The other thing that was mentioned um, on the panel was about judicial uh, training and speaking to uh, you know, judges or speaking to legislators. The one thing that has happened in Pakistan, I mean, I'm talking about our own personal uh, experience, was that we did in fact uh, meet with legislators and we did in fact meet with judges. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the judges that we met was is the judge who's actually heading um, the YouTube case. So definitely, I would you know, sort of agree with the point that meeting them made a lot of difference because when the case came in the Lahore High Court for unbanning of YouTube, the judge had already met us and several others and was able to identify those individuals as amicuses in the case. So one way that the rule of law or existing law was used was how the amicuses played a strong role in further strengthening petitioners, having the best constitutional lawyer as one of the amicuses, having another civil society group working with an existing civil society petitioner. Um, and another thing that you know, I wanted, wanted to mention and then ask a question uh, directed at Jillian was that we need more examples of how we can use existing laws, let's say freedom of information laws, to demand more accountability yeah. from the government. One of the successes that we've had is that when we recently applied for, uh, we recently requested for a freedom of information request. We didn't get the details in time, but we eventually did. And we, we're just going to release a document which is called um, the official announcement for the formation of the Interministerial Committee for Evaluation of Websites sounds just like right out of Orwell's book. But we've never ever had 
any official document to revert back to about what the committee is, when exactly was it found, and it was found in uh, 2006, by the way, who sits on the committee and what are the TORs. We have it now and we, need, we want to work mm -hmm. towards having that document and then now questioning the, um, the committee itself and its TORs. Before that, there have been innumerable times that multiple civil society organizations and media has questioned its stance. Okay. So with Julian, EFF works really strongly with combining, you know, the perfect combination of having technologists, having litigator, you know, having litigations done and using research to get that data. So what are some of the things that we can do? What are some of the examples that we can learn from where we can use existing law to hold governments accountable and to not allow them to use things like blasphemy law and others to intimidate dissent? Good. That's a good question. It's a great Over question. To you. Uh, it's a great question with a very difficult answer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to try to respond to this. I mean, so uh, briefly, just my organization um, is built around the concept of impact litigation, and that's been our primary focus and strategy for the past 24 years since we've been around uh, 1990, and. In increasingly, we're also relying on a multi-pronged strategy in tackling these issues. And so it's not just a matter of impact litigation, and I'm going to mention a, a specific case in a moment, um, but also a matter of building and, and um, collaborating with other organizations on the, the building and uh, proliferation of privacy-enhancing technologies or anti-surveillance technologies, depending on how you want to think about that. Um, and on working through advocacy, supporting allies such as your organization and yours um, throughout the world. And so I think that the missing part of that is also, though, societal education. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, you know, that I, I really commend groups like Tactical Technology Collective for doing is focusing on the holistic approach. So it's not just a matter of policy or litigation or... Um, the technology, which I think we, you know, I put a lot of stock in these technologies to protect myself personally, but at the same time, that's not the only, that's actually sort of a nihilistic solution when you think about it. Okay, I'm just going to use these and forget policy, let's, you know, I, I, that doesn't make sense to me. And so I think that taking this holistic approach and focusing on building societies that are not using this argument, that are not talking about, oh, I have nothing to hide, because really, that whole concept, I mean, has its... I think the I have nothing to hide argument fits perfectly in the Soviet Union, not in our societies now. Um, this is something that, you know, when we discuss this, what you're essentially saying is that you trust that your government will never change, and governments change rapidly, governments change overnight. And so I think that that's a huge, huge part of it. Um, but just to mention a case, because I wanted to bring this up, and this is in response to your question and into something that Shazad was saying about an independent judiciary, is that... I'm at a loss in thinking about how that matters when you have a government that feels that it can invoke state secrets law to protect itself against yeah. these things. True. So one of our cases, um, Jewel versus, so we're suing the NSA, by the way, if you didn't know that. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> expected more applause for that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, I'm not suing them, I'm not a lawyer, but anyway. Um, so one of our cases, Jewel versus the NSA, um, we're suing the NSA and other government agencies um, on behalf of AT&T customers. AT&T is one of our telecoms, um, and it collaborated directly with the NSA to, wire, to illegally wiretap the phone calls of American citizens. Um, and in this case, what the, what the US government did was invoked the state secrets privilege to argue that, okay, even if all of these allegations about law breaking are true, and constitutional violations as well, uh, you know, the surveillance of Americans is just completely exempt from judicial review. So yes, we have an independent judiciary. Yes, the consequences of surveillance in the United States on scale are not nearly the same as the consequences in Russia or China or Pakistan. And I think that that's a cogent point. But at the same time, I, I think that we're all talking about the same thing and that all of us in this room would agree that we don't we don't believe that this should be happening, that we do all have something to hide, and that on fundamental principle, what these governments are doing, no matter what the consequences, is wrong. Okay, good, thank you for that. Gentleman here with a question. Do we have some? Um, thank you, panelists and moderator. I am Sechitoriko Vincent. I'm from Sexual Minorities Uganda and we work for LGBT persons. My presentation is going to be mixed with uh, recommendations and problems. 
Where I come from in Uganda, in 2004, February 24th, the Anti-Homosexuality Act was passed by Parliament and the President signed it. And what happened is um, from 24th to 27th of February, I had lost 20 friends from Facebook. 20 friends from Facebook. And why did I lose these friends? I didn't lose these friends because I was gay. I lost these friends because I am an LGBT activist. Now, what does this mean to accessing internet for the next one billion person? Yesterday I was wondering whether really, if all activists in Uganda, on average of 20 activists who are LGBT, can lose 20 friends in three days each, whether we shall be able to reach the target of one billion persons. What do I recommend to this house? There is a stream of laws which is sweeping the global south. And internet providers should be curious and serious about this stream and should work hard to fight this stream of laws. My colleague in Nigeria has spoken about the anti-mongering bill. In Uganda, we are talking about the anti-pornography bill. We are talking about the anti-homosexuality bills. And these bills, what do they say? If you promote if you allow anybody to download anything from internet which is related to pornographic material, that internet has to be sanctioned. And you have to pay highly, and you have to go to prison. In the Anti-Homosexuality Act, even communicating to an LGBT activist, an LGBT person, or being friend to LGBT only, can cause you sanctions and closing down your company. But I believe in Uganda, our government is so good at receiving taxes, and it loves income. In 2014, when Facebook threatened to close down Uganda connections because of the Anti-Homosexuality Act, the parliament of Uganda slowly started backsliding on voting for the Anti-Homosexuality Bill. I request everybody in the house who is an internet service provider, Tigo, Ericsson and others, please, when you come to our communities, try as much as possible to emphasize to our governments to open spaces, even to minority populations, or else our target for one billion will be affected. Okay. My second recommendation, <laughs> my... If you, if you could make it quite short so yeah. that others can also... Yeah. My second recommendation is working with civil society groups. Because when ISPs come to these third world countries, they try to work with governments, of which governments don't pay, tax, don't pay taxes and don't pay for using your services. It's us who pay for these services. So work with us so that we reform the society. Don't isolate yourselves. And lastly, internet service provision should come with a package of education. Gillian uh, Olof and uh, my Nigerian colleague and others have spoken about this. To be truthful to you, I used internet when I was 20 years. But I had a phone which had internet. But my phobia was that uh, internet, my parents had told me that internet, and my priest in church used to tell me that internet is a source of immorality. You just learn sexual material from it, which I held up to 20 years. So I opened my spaces to internet when I was 21. Now, this is a bit silly. And if this uh, kind of phobia sweeps, because I have friends in rural areas who don't use the internet because they think when they use internet, they are going to access only sex material. So they reserve themselves from the internet. So we need to educate the African child. We need to educate the lesbian girl, the gay boy, the fathers and so on about the benefits and the goodness of being on internet. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, eloquence of those remarks. Uh, we welcome more questions. Uh, the gentleman around the middle of the hall. Hi. Um, I had two questions for the group, and they're kind of related. Uh, the first is I'm, I'm having trouble making the connection. Uh, and I, there is a connection, so I hope you can explain it. Political change requires public action, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. 
how does that fit in with privacy? Are you guys talking about privacy or are you talking about anonymity, which allows for political speech? So I'm not, I'm not sure I see the connection as, as important, as being as important as you do. If political change requires public action, where does privacy fit in? The second question is, um, civil society works very well in countries where there is the rule of law, right? But the chief opponents of internet freedom today are countries where the rule of law is weak. They intend to hijack the internet to gain control of content. How does civil society effectively engage with countries where the rule of law is weak? When we know what happens to activists in those countries, how do we avoid the fate of human rights activists in Russia? Very good. So um, I'm going to ask Olaf to direct his attention to the second part of that and Gillian to the first part. Great. Um, so I also would agree with you in saying that advocacy requires public action, but then I would also take a step back and look throughout history at the change that has been made through illegal action, through civil disobedience, um, all the way back throughout our history from science through arts, through every, you know, every facet of our society, the changes that we have made have come both from public action, of course, but also from private organizing. And if our governments are monitoring our every move, our every thought, then I don't see how that change is possible. If, to use Uganda as an example, since it was just raised, if in Uganda it is illegal to organize around LGBT rights, and if Uganda were to have the same scale of spying that the United States does, and obviously harsher consequences, then how could that organizing ever happen if people are being rounded up one by one for their private communications? So I do think absolutely, I agree fundamentally as an activist that we must take public action, but I also believe that in order to change a society, you must have the right to private action as well. Olaf, how do we address this issue of creating space and freedom in the digital sphere in those jurisdictions where it is not honored in the physical sphere, on the streets, in the media, in the rule, in, in the courts of law and so forth? Uh, well, we have to work within the framework of the global institutions. Uh, for example, uh, Dunja has left uh, yesterday. Uh, she's not here, but she is the champion of freedom of expression in, in the OSCE area. Uh, and uh, she is harassed by certain countries. I, won't, I have already mentioned one of them. Uh, but uh, that's the way we can do. Uh, but let me say about the principal issue of, yep. of, of public action and, and privacy. I think this is a very, very interesting uh, issue. And it is a difference between the United, tradition in the United States and the tradition in Europe. Because in the United States, you have the freedom of expression and the First Amendment, which is the, the most holy cow in the American Constitution. In, in Europe, we, uh, last week we had a, a, a decision taken by the European Court yep. uh, with regard to Google, which actually uh, takes the rather opposite view, the right to be protected. Uh, or for, to be pro forgotten. forgotten, right to be forgotten. And if you are a public personality, how, uh, if you are uh, actually challenging to, to get elected to some sort of, of, of being a, a member of parliament, how, how, is there a right to be forgotten if you had said something stupid before? Uh, I mean, this is, this is an interesting, uh, interesting difference. And I have a friend who was actually, he was, writing a book where he said that one of the Ukrainian oligarchs were a corrupt personality. His problem was that he's published that book in, in, in UK, where you are liable Indeed. for this. If he had published it in Sweden, he would have been perfectly uh, uh, free of any charges, okay. because that, that was... So there are constitutional differences here between the US and, uh, uh, and Europe. My ideal would be to have the American First Amendment and the European privacy legislation. Yep. Okay. Can I respond as well? Please. I know we're nearly out of time. I think how can you actually have effective public action without the right to privacy? How do you organize public action without being, to communicate, without being able to communicate safely and securely with your colleague, colleagues? So I think the rule of law needs to protect privacy in order Absolutely. to allow effective public action. So I don't think there's a contradiction there at all. And, and with regard to your second question about, about civil society action in, in repressive context, that's an age-old question, and that's why 
we had an anti-apartheid struggle and that's why we won. And that's why there are struggles from activists in all countries. So I think there's a, yep. there's a tension and there's a conflict there. Um, but I think it's precisely in context of repression where civil society, if they endure and if they have support, can ultimately um, be, be most Very effective. Good. Very good. Joe Kim, um, in, the outer, in the outer space, yep. what, are, what is the world saying about us and these is issues we're raising? Well, they're saying you're doing a pretty good job, and they're focusing on the necessity to see rule of law in a global context. So, FISA, Patriot has 40 protections yes. only for you as citizens, and that, that's obviously not a good idea. The necessity to educate the judiciary, uh, the necessity of the 13 principles, and obviously the necessity of panelists to tweet. Everyone is very impressed by Gillian's avid tweeting. Very good. <laughs> Follow avid up on uh, the website and on uh, CIF 14 and FX Internet. Very good an avid tweeter. I saw a gentleman behind the question that we just had. Who, that's the gentleman who's raised his hands there. We've got to close in a few minutes. I'll try and cram in a couple more before we do, if the organizers allow. Sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, would have tweeted this, but it's much longer than 140 characters, so I apologize and bear with me, and I'll try to read from my notes so I don't stray uh, too far. Uh, on the issue of rule of law and international law, or global rule of law and universal human rights, universal norms. Uh, they are exactly that, universal. And many countries have signed and ratified these conventions that agree to the fact that they are universal. But there is a flaw in the, in the process through either exemptions, uh, through reservations, and so forth. And beyond that, uh, you have countries like China, like Iran, like many others, that have signed and ratified these documents but then they claim various cultural exemptions. They say, well, they're universal, but they're, they don't apply to us in every situation. Um, and they go so far sometimes to say, well, these are products of Western dominance. They're sort of extensions of imperialism and so forth. And they use these to uh, excuse their non-compliance. Meanwhile, they have an active civil society engaged in mobilization, couching that mobilization in the vocabulary of international norms. Um, the, the issue is then, I think, how to hold, uh, or to no longer create a space where it's acceptable for these governments to hide uh, behind such exemptions and so forth. And one of the ways to do that, I think, is by bridging both the material and the digital concepts of uh, universal norms and so forth. So by empowering the same civil society that is engaged in material collective action with this vocabulary. So that's where uh, I think... Um, okay. Sorry. Oh, uh, that's, that's where then, of course, this issue of, of um, free expression comes in. So what I'm asking is, um, I, it's time for concrete assurances, I think, from countries that are engaged in this fight that will no longer uh, allow for a space for this sort of culture of exemption in terms of uh, international law to take place. Yeah. Okay. And uh, are not relative. within that, sorry, um, Following through, in terms of both material or digital reprisals, right now the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights has been pushing through an attempt for concrete mechanisms on holding states accountable for reprisals against human rights defenders on the ground. And that conversation is stalled in the General Assembly, and it's time for concrete actions both from state actors, but also what can civil society do, both material and digitally, to force their country representatives, and in other ways to force these types of measures to come into play. Th thank you for that. That's partly an observation, partly a question. The question part, I think I'm going to fold into subsequent sessions that we've got this morning on democracy um, uh, and other dimensions, because I am getting a strong signal from the organizers they would like this session to come to an end. Before it does, I want to come back to something I raised earlier on, which is, why does Gillian have 13 principles? Why do you have only seven? Well, yeah. You go yeah, first. Yeah, we, actually, what we tried to do was to set up a minimum standard, and that was compatible with a number of different constitutional traditions. We have, I mean, only in the European Union we operate at least three, maybe four constitutional okay. traditions. There is a French, there is an Anglo Saxon, there is a German, and if you could maybe also say there is a Scandinavian. And there are, uh, and the list, the certain list, I would say, is a, a maximum list. I, I don't think that this is something, I mean, 
I would not the long, It isn't the longer the better. It's not necessarily the longer no. the better, okay. but it's it's an Let issue you, of include, come back on this. I would say it is an issue of being able to include as many of the open, democratic, free societies okay. as possible. Julia? So I'm going to focus just on one exclusion from the, those yeah. seven principles because we're short on time. In the 13 principles, one of ours is the integrity of communications and systems. And so the idea is in recognition of the fact that compromising security for state purposes always compromises security more generally. And this is crucial because legal protections are only a part of what protects you. We need legal protection, we need policy protection, but we also need protection of our technology. And so in this context, there are technical questions with not just with, with respect to what the government can do in terms of surveillance, but how we can protect ourselves. And so if you have all of the, if you have the rule of law in place, if you have all of these other principles in place, but then the government can collaborate with companies to build back doors into the systems, then what is the point? Mm -hmm. You will have heard, ladies and gentlemen, of the right to be forgotten. I want, on behalf of the panel, who I don't know very well, but I think we've already become friends, to exercise the right to be remembered <laughs> and to be thanked by you for their contributions. Thank you very much.